guys. Welcome back. This is the May issue of Shutter Magazine, and I'm Philip Bloom. And we're talking about uh, not just weddings this month, but in particular, how do you reframe, reshape the market that you're in? Do you really have control over the leads that come to you? If you're receiving unqualified leads all the time, it seems like, does that mean your market is bad? Or could it mean that we ourselves are doing something wrong? And it takes a lot of humility to kind of approach that possibility. Um, but I think it's often true. And so I wanted to talk to you, um, and you can read in the, the, uh, in the magazine a lot of these points, but I wanted to touch home on some of the main ones. Um, before that, one matter of housekeeping. Um, Eileen and I are actually headed out of town now, uh, probably 15 minutes, so we have to go to the airport for some really exciting fashion shoots in London with uh, celebrity fashion designer Alita Herbst. And we've been excited about this project for a while. Um, so if you're part of our community uh, online community of photographers, um, we're going to be showing some of the behind the scenes of that and really excited to work with some new lighting equipment um, that I've just been playing with and, and ready to use on a real shoot. So feel free, if you're not part of that community, you can just go to bloomphotography.com slash photographers or just um, find photographers up at the top of the site and join. And we'll be um, doing that in the, in the coming month as well. Uh, so back to the point, though, with weddings. Um, my friend Scott Robert Lim, a great, um, one of the most award-winning international um, wedding photographers out there, uh, was over here at our studio for workshops, and we got to talking about this this topic of weddings, um, how there really are different parts of the market, segments of the market, and each one of those segments is represented by a different kind of consumer. Um, it's something that's hard that we don't usually think about. We just think that there's this big pot of couples getting married. Engaged couples, there's only so many of them, and there's all of these photographers saturating the market, and they're all going after those couples, trying to grab them up. Um, that's really not the case. In fact, you as a brand um, have a responsibility to define who you are and, um, and have a consistent style such that it attracts a kind of a particular client who's looking for you, essentially. You're selling yourself and, and you're finding those clients who you jive with, who you match up well with. A lot of couples hire photographers as a last option because they don't find anyone like that. But if you can find your niche and be that photographer who shoots just vineyard uh, estate weddings or that one who shoots the funky weddings with the cool light setups, if you find that niche, then all of those couples who are out there you'll find will start to flock to you. And there's a lot of things in workflow along the way um, that you can do to make sure that you allow those leads to be more and more qualified. Um, just give you one great example. A lot of times we have leads that come in our inbox. I think all of us do. And uh, we reply to them and we don't really get any feedback or by the time we hear back from them, they've already chosen another photographer. And we think those leads were unqualified. When in fact, um, some interesting research from Harvard shows that often it's because we waited more than 24 hours to respond. If you respond to your inquiries within the first one hour, I know you hear all the time, respond within 24 hours. If you respond within the first one hour, your likelihood of booking that lead actually goes up 700%. So you and I are often responsible for whether our leads are qualified or not. Now back to Scott Robert Lim, he and I had a lot to talk about um, he, he very smartly points out the different segments of the market, um, those brides that are going after $1,500 photographers, those brides who want you for who you are and are willing to spend up to $10,000. Um, and so I want to just show you this conversation we had on Facebook Live, uh, allow you to, if you haven't seen it before, benefit from that and wish you all the best in this coming wedding season. Thanks, guys. I'm Philip Bloom, and we'll see you at Community as well as in the next issue of Shutter Magazine. Have a good one. Uh, well, welcome you guys to the studio, Boom Studio here. Um, awesome to have you, Scott, actually in our home studio. Finally. Thanks, Thanks for having me. It's been a, kind of a long wait. I've been dreaming about this <laughs> every night. So. Me too. <laughs> I don't know how sincere that is. But then I was just a sorely disappointed. You come into our lives like this, and you crush my spirit nearly with... <laughs> Saying the opposite, almost the opposite of what, what I'm always saying about how you need to, 
you know, you can't just be shoot and burn all your life. You have to offer products. You have to be a full service studio. Right. And then you came in to speak to our local trigger happy group, and and you talked about how the shoot and burn wedding is like the best job in the world. Fifteen hundred dollar shooter. And spoiler alert: we're not going to completely put up our dupes and like battle this <laughs> shoot and burn versus full right. service thing out because. You said something that was, to me, really insightful, um, a different way of looking at why $1,500 is maybe not such a bad idea, but there right. is some danger in there. You just have to be, you have to be knowledgeable about what your business structure is and, right. and why it would fail if you do the wrong things. Yes. So, that, I, actually, before I turn it over to you, let me just kind of explain where I'm coming from. Sure. Because our experience, Eileen and I as wedding photographers, um, started out in a place where uh, we were shoot and burn. I think everyone kind of starts that way, um, and and came to a point where we were starting to have children. Our lives were just completely enveloped by our business, um, and photography was no longer a joy, and our children were feeling neglected. Uh, and we and we came up we came to a realization that we wanted to offer product, you know, like really fine wedding books and handmade, yeah, hand bound type things because we wanted our sort of a mission statement of our business became we wanted our clients to have something they could pass down generationally. Of course. And so, and that became very, very valuable. That's what kept our business afloat and saved our lives, kind of. Um, but, then this slide came up last night when you were speaking, <laughs> and just kind of explain this to us, because it's it actually really smart. I, I love the way you described it. Um, yeah, well, first of all, I did exactly that. I. Um, came to the conclusion that I had to make a certain amount of money for it all to work, right? And of course, you know, once you offer products, you know, albums, and um, you can make a lot more money with it. But after doing, you know, going through uh, my, you know, 15-year career of doing weddings and post-processing and all that kind of stuff, I come to the conclusion that every wedding with consultations, engagement sessions, and all that kind of business, going back and forth with the client, took me about three weeks worth of work. Of course, it was just three weeks bring solid. Bring all workflow together and realize Yeah, that. and so I go, well, if it's three weeks worth of work, you gotta make at least $10,000, I mean, you know, to make it all flow, right? Right. Um, and then, so I look, started looking at it from a, another business perspective, and then the shoot and burn model actually seemed more workable from a scalable point. Okay, so explain it's scale. When you talk about scalable, that's a term that we throw around sometimes, I think, but yeah. I didn't know it a couple years ago, really. Okay, scalable means is, okay, so when you start your photography business, a, a lot of us are just one-man shows. We have right. to do everything. And especially in your case, you didn't have like a Philip Eileen couples. No. Like, it was like all on just me. that workflow was in your... Right, so I had to get really efficient with my workflow, but there was a maximum amount of time and energy I could put towards my business. Right. And so, like, I, my money depended on my work. So, scalable means is that you kind of grow your business and you get outside of yourself and you can grow your business when you're really not part of it. <laughs> because, because you're depending now on other people. Other people, yes. Which is the, probably the most frightening, like, choke you up kind right. of feeling. As if you're, especially if you're like a perfectionist, you know, art, often we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's our art, it's our signature. Read the E-Myth, that book talks about it. Yeah, perfect. That is actually a fantastic book. Yeah. So, so um, what I came to the conclusion so when I was at you know the highest pinnacle of my wedding photography and I was getting flown around the world and getting paid a lot of money, I realized I could not duplicate myself because my style was so signature to me that even if I tried to train somebody, it's still not me and nobody's gonna hire my brand at that level. Right. So I figured, you know what? But you can train somebody to do a burn and shoot fifteen hundred dollar wedding. I felt like I could train anybody. Literally, I could train anybody to shoot a fifteen hundred dollar burn and shoot wedding, and that's scalable because I could find more people and produce consistent quality. And so I could job that out, right? Let's say I charge fifteen hundred dollars. Literally, it's shooting it, right? Uh, taking the files and just handing it over, right. 
And what did you, you were just talking earlier before we went on live about um, why that is like, even if it's not stealing, even if you don't have employees right. doing that for you, sort of think of it in terms of if you could potentially do that every weekend, how that's the right. best job. Okay, so uh, when I was talking to the group yesterday, I said, hey, is it possible to do a shoot and burn wedding for $1,500 and somebody would pay me? Everybody said, yeah. And most, but in the industry, you constantly have people laughing at that, like, you know, you're not a real photographer. <laughs> right? Yeah. So I appreciate your respect that you show to people who are doing it for money. Right. No, so I did this logic. I said, listen, is that possible? Yes, it is possible. Could you do that every single week? Yes, that's possible. Okay. Well, that's making $75,000. Oh, giving yourself a two-week vacation on top of that. Too. Yeah. You're just 50 weeks. Working my day $75,000 working eight to 10 hours a week. That's the best job in America. And so actually one of the gals there at, the, at our thing yesterday, she was actually doing that, but for a lot more. She was getting twice that much. Right. right. So she was Doing having a very travel successful. weddings and destinations and that yeah. sort of thing, but just turning she over. Was, so she was getting, and she does it, she was getting $4,000 right. burn and shoot weddings. Now, now, this is where the gloves come off a little bit. Yeah. Because um, I, I, can, I completely see the math. And like for a photographer who that's what they need to do um, to make their business work, um, I, I think it's, it's fantastic and they should be respected for that. But then for us, it comes to a point where a lot of photographers we're teaching, um, we're teaching them about vision for your business. And we wanted to start producing something to be sure, right. be sure every one of our couples had that to give to their children one day. But then my question is, why can't you just do both? Okay, yeah. Very good point. Why can't you just do both? Right? If that client wants to burn and shoot, give it to him because it's still profitable. If that client wants albums and so forth, and that's important to them, why not give that? Because why? It's profitable. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to get into a situation, kind of what we talked about, where you're in the middle, right? When average, somebody average, shows you 25. I want to this is average. <laughs> average annual wants 25 to 35 for a wedding, and she wants the album, the engagement session, and all that kind of stuff. And that's, that's where when I mean, it's not profitable. That's where Eileen and I were stuck. We're trying to charge what was a, a reasonable amount to, to sort of what we felt, you know, allow us to have a life where we weren't shooting 50 Yeah, 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 yeah. We yeah. had our children that we could take care of. But you, we couldn't sell that without, without yeah, so what putting I more work into the art. So side. what I showed here with the four different types of brides, this, there's the same amount of work in this $2,500, $3,500 package versus the $10,000 plus package. There's the same amount of work. You might as well just make more money. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So I feel like you got to be here and here to make it profitable to do like right. what you did. Other than, so if you're stuck here, you either got to move out of this type 2 category into here quickly or go back down, or why don't you do this and develop another brand and do this yeah. at the same time? Yeah. Which was my mistake, I should have done that. But uh, hindsight's 2020. Yeah, it's all about profitability, right? Exactly. And I understand that you want to, what you want to create and what's significant to that client, yeah. but um, you know, you still have to be profitable. Yes. And I think the moral- We both agree on that. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the moral of the story, I think, is don't get cut in that middle dead yeah. zone where you are trying to, to give a full service to your clients, which is great. Like to be able to do that is, is a great service to your clients. It, it helps increase your perceived value as a brand. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're, incre if you're doing all that to, and if you're increasing your perceived value, but then you're still not confident enough to raise your actual value and your prices, then you're, it's not going to last. And we were looking at the statistics, like most people, vast majority of people trying to do this fail at it because they yeah. don't make that step. Yeah, and I think what helps them um, to get to that next level, which you guys do a lot too, is your coaching and mentoring and helping other people, which I also do, is that when you're in that middle zone and you, because I figure you're either going to break through it or not. Right. And if you don't, you're going to be stuck there for a couple of years or so. If you feel like you're stuck, get help immediately before you run out of money or your credit card gets maxed. All your credit cards yeah. get maxed all the way. In that, in that same note, um, I hope that some of this information kind of gets to your gears turning and uh, and thinking about how how to put yourself in the market. Thanks, thanks, guys. Bye, bye. Peace out.